This is the Best Health Podcast, brought to you by Wake Forest Baptist Health in partnership with MedCost. Good day, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Best Health Podcast, brought to you by Wake Forest Baptist Health in conjunction with MedCost. We're thankful that you're listening to us today. We have another great program lined up for you. Great, great guest. Uh, Great following on Twitter. Uh, Dr. John Shields will be joining us talking about orthopedic surgery and and hip and knee and joint replacements. So welcome, Dr. Shields. How are you, sir? Good, good. Great. Glad to be here. And, and, uh, and uh, thank you for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for taking the time. I know you all have been particularly busy lately. Um, So before we dive in, just want to remind everyone If you're listening to this podcast episode as your first Best Health episode, feel free to check out other Best Health podcast episodes in the podcast store that you utilize to download podcasts. They're also available at wakehealth.edu slash podcast. They surround a a wide variety of topics from COVID-19 related information to heart and cardiology and cancer and, of course, orthopedics, Brenner Children's wide array of topics, so I hope you find them useful. Uh, Like I said today, we're going to be talking with Dr. John Shields, and we have, there's so much information we can kind of go into with with that healthiness of a joint, uh, when the joint starts becoming unhealthy, why that may occur, and then, you know, people dealing with pain surrounding their, their hip and knee joints, and talking about, you know, maybe some people having a fear of actually having this replacement surgery and putting, you know, a a medical device inserted into their body with a a artificial hip or artificial knee joint and maybe explaining and and calming down some of those nerves about about the whole process. We'll get into all those things. Um, I will say, Dr. Shields, before we get started with that, if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about yourself and your background and why you, you chose to get into medicine. Yeah, sure. So, so I am John Shields. I, I'm a group in Danville, Virginia. I am. Okay. And so, so I'm not too far from home. No, I, I am at an undergraduate at, at, and I'm at William and Mary. I am at a med school at UVA. I am at a residency here at Wake Forest. So obviously I came back. I am. I went away for a year up to Boston. I am. I did a fellowship. I am an adult reconstruction. I am in total joint replacement. So I did a year where all I did is eat, sleep, and breathe hip and knee replacements. Um, then I came back and I've been, I'm on faculty now at Wake for, this is going on my eighth, eighth year, I believe, here at Wake Forest. Um, and, and, and I'm a love it here. You know, that's why I came back. Um, mm-hmm. How did I get into this? Growing up, um, to be able to tell in this podcast, you don't have a stutter. And, and I guess, you know, being sort of, you know, having sort of, you know, I guess you could say, yeah, is sort of a disability. I've always had this idea of, you know, I want to help people who, who sort of, you know, have a problem um, or in pain, you know, or suffering. Um, and, and I've always liked to work with my hands and sort of had that avenue. And then about the ninth grade, um, I sort of paired up with an orthopedic surgeon um, <laughs> And I watched him one day in the operating room, and it was, I am, I, it was just a connection. I'm always mm-hmm. in love. And then through that connection, I got a job in the operating room where I sort of worked as an orderly, um, and, and I mopped floors, um, and always in my downtime, I was always in the, in the ortho rooms, always watching surgeries, always watching, you know, hip and knee replacements, uh, mm-hmm. you know, nailing femurs, you know, nailing tibias, um, and I loved it. And so mm-hmm. from high school on, I'm always going to be an orthopedic surgeon. Um, and so it, it was, um, it was a drive from sort of, I must say ninth grade on, I'm it was just a passion that, um, that, you know, I was not going to give up on and I'm, I, I, I was no looking back really. Well, that is really, that is really cool information and, and encouraging as well. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Um, yeah, that's awesome. I, I did not know what I wanted to do in the ninth grade. So I'm, <laughs> glad, I'm glad you were able to, to find out at an early age and, and pursue that passion. Um, so I want to start off just kind of with a baseline level set of, of information about um, there's so many different options and, and care plans and treatment plans within orthopedics. 
And just because you're having hip pain or knee pain doesn't automatically mean you're going to ha need a, a joint replacement necessarily. So I guess maybe when you spend time in clinic with patients and maybe the initial visit of, of a patient coming in and they're having hip pain or knee pain and they're not sure what it is, what's causing it, or maybe, you know, how severe it might even be, you know, kind of talk to us a little bit about, you know, if, if some, the spectrum of someone might have some arthritis um, that can be um, treated with, with a non-surgical option, all the way up to the discussion you start having with a patient about maybe joint replacement might be, it might be time for a joint replacement. Sure. So, so you know, hip and knee pain is extraordinarily common. Yeah. Um, you know, extraordinarily common. And so it can be um, as mild as sort of just, uh, you know, a daily nuisance. It just, you know, bothers you here and there um, mm -hmm. to, to, you know, people that come in clinic and they're, they're in a wheelchair, um, it can barely walk. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so what, what we do um, is we, you know, have to get an idea of, um, you know, how much this bothers you on a daily basis mm -hmm. and are you able to do, you know, all the activities, you know, that you want to do on a daily basis? How much are you limited? How much are you suffering? You know, what have you tried? You know, there, there are lots of, of sort of, uh, I am a conservative options out there. You know, there, there are, you know, the over the counter or the anti-inflammatories, the ibuprofen and the Aleve. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I am a prescription anti-inflammatories and your Tylenol. Um, there, 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 I am is physical therapy. Um, there, there, I have lots of data that, you know, is coming out that, you know, actually, the the ice, the more active that you are, the uh, ice, the better off you do. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, every pound of weight I uh, I am on your body. Mm -hmm. That was I uh, I I'm a study out of Wake Forest, you know, years ago. Every pound of weight on your body, I'm as three to five pounds of weight uh, on your joints. And so, you know, getting you know getting out, you know, and getting active, you know, and losing a little bit of weight, I'm just going to help your joints in the long run. You know, a lot of people say, well, if my joints hurt, you know, I should get off of them. I should rest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you should do the opposite, you know, get out and move. Um, there, there are IMR injections we can do, there are you know, braces we can do. So there, there are lots of uh, I am a conservative options out there that we can do to uh, you know, try to buy a little bit of time. Um, and, you know, we get x-rays to see, uh, you know, do you have a lot of arthritis, have a little bit of arthritis? Um, you know, do you have any, uh, I am any meniscal pathology in your knees, you know, have some, you know, some tears of the cartilage that, you know, needs any management. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we, you know, we have to get to sort of the, the, uh, and have to get to the bottom of the problem. Um, and, you know, how bad is the problem? I am, um, I tell patients, you know, if you're able to do all the things that, you know, you want to do on a regular basis, you know, our job um, is to make that as tolerable as I am as possible. I'm going to keep you out of the operating room as long as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, well, that is our goal. I'm um, to keep you out of the OR. Um, mm -hmm. you know, but if you are miserable, um, and you're, you know, you're sitting at home on a, on a beautiful afternoon and saying, gosh, I would love to play golf. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, I'd love to go and play tennis. I'd love to, you know, get up in the yard, you know, play with the grandkids. And I'm not able to, because my knee hurts me and I'm miserable and I've tried all those conservative options mm -hmm. and I'm just, and I'm failing. Then, you know, it us when we go down the surgical road. Okay. That's, that's great information. So Dr. Shields, when, when you start talking about um, the surgical option with a patient, you know, I, I've heard patient stories from the past where maybe it's sort of a common theme that they're like, man, I wish I, wish I would have done it sooner. You know, I wish I would have come in sooner. I, and they were kind of put it off for one reason or another. Maybe, maybe there's some hesitation or reluctance or fear so when you're talking with your patients and you start having the surgery conversation, do you, do you get that a lot in, in the clinic rooms where they're kind of like, eh, I don't know, there, there, there's maybe some apprehension or fear just because, you know, generally we like to try and avoid people cutting, cutting on us. Sure. Um, so what's that conversation like to help put their mind at ease a little bit? We spend a lot of time, I'm on the front end, on the education. Um, I, you know, I think the more that you know, on the front end, um, I think the better off the process is. You're like education is power, um, mm -hmm. and so you know um, I spend a lot of time. I, I, I'm explaining the procedure, explaining you know what is going to happen. I am in the preoperative period, in the postoperative period. You know what you know the the, the rehab process is going to look like. You know obviously 
hips and knees are very different animals. And so the, mm -hmm. the it's a conversation I'm is very different for knees than it is hips. Um, the, mm -hmm. the, the rehab on knees, you know, takes a lot longer than the, 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 as a rehab on hips. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but you spend a lot of time, uh, I must spend a lot of time having those conversations. I am our nurses taking lots of time having conversations. We have got, I have got, uh, I've got a group of nurse navigators that, mm -hmm. that the sort of you, that, you know, should come around the front end and the back end and making you know, lots of phone calls mm -hmm. to help with those educations. And we send you home with, I, um, there, there sort of as information as a folder of information that you go home and you read through. Um, I'll tell patients, it'll answer a lot of questions that you don't even know you have yet. Yeah. Um, then they're, they're hooked up, you know, through the portal. Uh, I am on the wake portal. I am, they can drop us emails as questions, you know, pop up. And we now have the, I am have the force application, mm -hmm. which can go online um, and watch all sorts of educational uh, ha, 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 ha videos along the way. I'm mm -hmm. Then it prompts them on the front end and on the back end. And so I think the more that you know, I, the easier the process is. Um, I think if you go into a blind, I mean, it's pretty scary. Um, but, but I think our nurses in mean, the clinic, our nurses on the floor, um, on the back end, make the process about as easy as it can be. Uh, That's true. Really cool. Surgery. Um, and so, you know, surgery is scary, uh, no matter how, how you dice it. But yeah. um, they make it. I'm um, as easy as it can be. And, you know, this is a, it, it's something that, you know, we as a team, you know, do every day. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, uh, that's very, very helpful. So you've had that conversation, the patient's mind is at ease and, and okay. So they're like, all right, let's do this. And they schedule the surgery. So once they actually schedule the surgery and it's, it's on the docket on the, on the schedule, what can a patient expect from there uh, until they get into the OR and act? out into recovery what what's that process like so do they have what, to do anything special or anything as they're leading up to surgery so what what you know i try to do in the clinic visit after all the education i personally try to pick a date because i think yes you know, important as you leave the clinic visit that you know you have a date in hand and you, and, and you know the date that's going to work with your schedule because the beauty of you know hip and knee replacement you know selective surgery in the sense that you know it's not a heart attack and you plan it you know around your schedule when it fits you know your schedule I am in your spouse's schedule. I am in your work schedule. I am you plan that surgery and you leave the clinic and you have a date in hand. Um, <laughs> can we get a bunch of lab work and look, you know, at your kidney function, your blood counts, and make sure everything looks okay and is safe for surgery. And we have, uh, and we have time that if we see any abnormalities in those labs that we sort of, you know, make adjustments. Um, we talk a lot about sort of how I am any medical optimization that sort of needs to be done to make sure that when you, when you go into surgery, it's as perfect as it could possibly be to, mm -hmm. to, to minimize any risk. You're going to, prior to surgery, I'm going to meet with anesthesia. We, we have sort of a surgical home model, and you meet with anesthesia, um, and they do their portion, and they optimize you for surgery, and you see that same sort of group of, of I am of anesthesiologists uh, on the floor after surgery, and you see them on the day of surgery, and they sort of I am, and they manage all your, I am all your medical care there in the perioperative period. Mm -hmm. um, I am the day of COVID. Uh, you know, we ask you that you, that you isolate, you know, a week before surgery and you have a COVID test, you know, prior to surgery and you keep sort of a temperature log um, is to make sure that, you know, all of our patients and all of our staff, you know, are safe as possible. Mm -hmm. I am, and you come in on the day of surgery. I am, you go back, I, I am into the, I am into the preoperative area and you get your IVs. I'm in your blood draws and, and you sort of get your, your, your IV cocktail, I call it. Um, and you get 90, 99, 98% of our surgery is done under what's called a spinal anesthesia. And mm -hmm. so you're sort of, I sure numbed up, you know, from the waist down, have some, some, uh, some nerve blocks, you know, for pain control. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of data that says that, that, that sort of, I, I said, that neuroactual anesthesia has got, you know, lower rates of nausea and vomiting, less, you know, pain control, <laughs> better pain control, mm -hmm. um, uh, how, you, how you lower rates of blood loss. It, it, and you get up and you get mobilized even faster every sur I am after surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and you feel better. You know, I go, I, am, I go around the afternoon after surgery and I round all patients and they're up and they're sitting in bed and they're laughing and they're joking and they're having dinner. Um, wow. And they feel good. And they say, you know, That's this is great. You know, this is really good. You know, I'm surprised, you know, how great I feel. And they go through and they have their surgery. It takes about an hour. 
Um, okay. And they go through in recovery about an hour and they hit the floor and their blocks wear off and they get up and, and they walk that day. That's awesome. So yeah, that's a good segue into, you know, you mentioned recovery at the end there. So surgery, you're in and out, uh, you're feeling okay. What does the, the overall recovery process look like? And you mentioned, you know, knees are different than hips, obviously. Maybe walk us a little bit through the recovery process for both for a hip surgery and then a knee surgery. And what can a patient expect? Are they going to have to use, you know, a walker or a cane for a certain sure. amount of time? Or what's that, what's that look like? To tell how I, I, how I describe this, I am as I sort of draw out an outline for patients in the clinic, and I describe patients sort of on a bell curve. Um, and this is the average patient. You know, there are you know, patients obviously on the front end of that bell curve, and there are patients on the back end of the bell curve. But, you know, the average patient, um, as far as a hip is concerned, um, have your surgery, and you get up and you walk on the day. I, 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 um, some patients go home on the same day. I am on a, I am on a same day surgery if you qualify. I'm some patients you need to go home on the next day. Um, but you get up and you walk on the day of surgery. Um, you'll be on a walker for about a week or less. You know, you'll be on a cane for about a week or two. And then we get you off everything all together. Um, average patients are, you know, generally getting back to their normal sort of everyday life around four to six weeks. Um, they know they have surgery, but they're generally getting back to most of their sort of normal everyday activity. Um, they're generally driving when they're on a single point cane. Um, they're not taking any, nar I am any narcotics in the daytime, which is generally around the three to four week mark. Um, and, and our goal is, you know, you know, when they hit the 10 week ish mark, you know, they don't even know they had surgery and they're back to all their normal activity. Um, okay. That, that's the goal for our hips. You know, they're generally on pain medicine, you know, three, four days, you know, in the daytime, and then they sort of are on it at night and with physical therapy and um, hips just, you know, hips just kind of cruise and they go to physical therapy t two days a week for I am a few weeks and they do exercises on their, on, on their own. Mm -hmm. um, knees are a little bit different. Knees, um, I tell patients, um, you, I'm, I've got some knees and they go home on the same day. Um, knees, you need to go home in the next day or the day after all, depending on how they feel and how they do. They've got those nerve blocks, you know, for pain control. Um, um, I tell patients with knees, um, you're going to be on a walker for about a week or two, and then you're on a cane for about a week or two, and then you get off everything altogether. Mm -hmm. I, I tell my patients, um, you know, draw two weeks, I'm going to draw a frowny face. And I say, for the first week, you're going to curse my name. <laughs> um, you're going to curse your, and you're going to curse your physical therapist, and you're going to curse your spouse, and you're going to mm. curse your dog, um, and you're not going to be happy. And I tell them, you know, that's okay. Knees hurt. Um, you know, it's a big surgery, and knees hurt more than hips because you have to, you know, work on your range of motion. But you know, we we and we send you home on. I'm on pain medicine, and we do sort of I some multimodal, you know, pain approach around the time of surgery and you get your ice and your nerve blocks. I am in your Tylenol. I am in your anti-inflammatories. I am in your narcotics. And we try to manage your pain as best we can. Um, mm -hmm. And it's controlled. And then, and once you get over that first, you know, week or two, I am, it gets better and it gets better every, every single week. Um, at the six week or so mark, um, I draw sort of a six and I draw, uh, I am a face with sort of a, I am a flat line by, for the mouth mm -hmm. and I think you're glad you had it done, but you're not in love with it. You know, you, mm -hmm. you, you know, you had a big surgery, um, and, but you're getting back to all your normal activities. You are driving, you're getting out and about and you're going out to dinner and you're doing sort of your normal, um, daily activities, but you know, you had a big surgery. Um, and then you really, really turn the corner around the 10 to 12 week mark and you get back to your normal activities. And that's the point, you know, that, that I, I draw the smiley face and the heart and I say, and it keeps getting, you know, it keeps getting better from there. Okay. Um, but it, it, it is a longer course for knees just cause you're, you're, I, I'm a lot more involved with physical therapy. It's a lot more work on the range of motion. Okay. I am, um, you're icing it down a lot. It's just, uh, it's a more involved, you know, process. Okay. That is a great overview. Uh, I hope that people can glean some, some information and some, um, 
I think some comfort in, in that explanation of the process that it is, um, you know, doable and, and there's definitely positive outcomes on the other side of the surgery. Yeah. You know, you mentioned physical therapy a couple of times. I want to ask you, you know, I think from, from previous things that I've heard, you know, you, the doctors, the nurses, the physical therapists, y'all really try and work together as a team with each patient, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's this journey that you're, you're following the patient all the way through. It's not just, okay, see you later. You had the surgery. Goodbye. It's really a, a journey that you're, you're helping them get through for the whole duration, right? Absolutely. It is a, it is a team sport, a hundred percent. Um, and, uh, um, it's every member of the team, Pam is critical. I am in the patient, you know, obviously as I am as the most important member of that team. Um, and everybody has yeah. to play their part. Um, and, and we lean on every single member of the team to mm -hmm. sort of, to, to have a good outcome. Now, in physical therapy, I am as critical. Um, and you know, the patient, you know, sort of gets, you know, goes to physical therapy. I'm on average two days a week. Um, and then they get sort of, you know, homework assignments, I call them, that they yeah. sort of go home every day and they do their homework, you know, every day and they work yeah. on the therapy every day and they go back, you know, and there's appointments, you know, PT and they check in to see, you know, how they're doing and their progress. And, you know, we get updates, you know, from the therapist, how they're doing. And, you know, if there's a concern, you know, they sort of, you know, <laughs> they reach out and they call us and our nurses, you know, call I am, um, they check on them and see how they're doing. You know, we call and check on them and, and they uh, have appointments, you know, sort of at the two week mark and the six week mark. And we check on them at those appointments. So there are lots and lots and lots um, of touch points along the way mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, that our patients are, are, um, are taken care of. I am in there. There are, I, I have lots of eyes. I am um, to, to, to care for our patients as they go through the process. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, and this might be getting um, a little bit into the weeds, but it's always interested me when I've seen some of the pictures on, on Twitter or on um, websites about the actual components that you are using for the, for the replacement. Mm -hmm. And if it, you know, hopefully it might be interesting to a few of our other listeners listening to this podcast, but Maybe talk to us about the actual components. Let's take a, a hip for an example. Sure. So there's the the devices that you are using for a hip replacement. They're kind of designed to mimic the body's original design, correct? Of, of yeah. what you're placing in the hip joint. So to so how the process works, um, um, as we go in, I um, we cut that femoral neck, um, and and I'm on the femoral side, you know. A tender thigh bone on the femoral side, we sort of um, have these little, I, it's like a rasp, it's called a brooch. I am, we broach out the femur, I'm up to a size, and the, the, and the femoral implants are made out of titanium, and okay. they have sort of, it's a roughened, I am a surface on the outside of them. I am, we, I am, we wedge those implants into the femur, um, uh, and it's called a press fit, and they go in the femur nice and tight, Mm -hmm. I am in those, the, I am the press fit or the wedge fit holds that implant in the bone for a period of time because they are wedged in there extraordinarily tight. And mm -hmm. then your, your, your eyes, the bone is going to grow into that implant because as I, you know, as I said, that implant sort of has a surface that is sort of as a roughened up sort of a porous surface is going to okay. grow into that implant and the bone that that I grows into that implant is going to hold it for the long term, and it's going to hold it for you know, for the life of the implant. And likewise, on the cup side, you have what's called a reamer. Um, it looks like a cheese grater. Um, it's sort of as a dome. I mean, it spins. I mean, it reams out the acetabulum or the cup side. I mean, the cup is also made of titanium. I mean, also has sort of by a porous side on the back. Um, and you literally take a mallet. I, it, I mean, it sounds a little gruesome, but you, know, you, you take a mallet and you pound that cup into the pelvis and it is as a press fit or it's a wedge fit and the press fit or the wedge fit is going to hold that cup into the pelvis for a period of time and your bone is going to grow into that cup and it's going to hold it permanently. Inside of the cup, there is a, is a locking mechanism that you hook a plastic liner into. Um, a, 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 a head ball goes on the femur. 
um, and the head ball, it, it, um, it seats into the plastic liner. The, the biggest advances in our technology, I think, have been in the plastics. Our, um, our plastics that, it, it, that we have today are, are, um, are much better than our plastics that we had uh, you know, I had 20 and 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so these in our hip replacement, our hip replacements and our bearing surfaces of today, I mean, it should last uh, uh, 30, 35 years for patients. Wow. Um, and part of the, uh, you know, I guess the magic uh, uh, I, um, of uh, hip replacements um, is how you put them in. It's the balancing of the joint and the balancing of the soft tissue. I'm in the angle of you know, how you put these implants in. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep it located. Um, I, is how you kind of put those components in and you balance out the joint. That is, that is, that's just cool. <laughs> I don't, that, I, you know, I, y'all do this every day and, you know, maybe it becomes, um, a little bit routine for y'all just to, to understand the process and the mechanics of it. But that's, that's fascinating that medical technology and, and the skill of the doctors and providers that's, that's able to happen and, and able to, help the patient recover and, and get back to the lifestyle that they are, that they're shooting for. That's really awesome. On the knee side. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit different. Uh, the, the implants are made, you know, I am, I am in a several, I am in a several materials. I am, I, I am either titanium, I am or cobalt chromium, uh, I am or auxinium, but, but that you, you know, uh, everybody has the idea that you sort of like you lop the joint off and replace them, but, but it's actually not that way at all. You, you sort of shave off the end of the femur and you sort of shave off the arthritis and it's, it's more of a cap. It's a cap on the femur. It's a cap okay. on the tibia. Okay. Um, and there are sort of hammer two ways, you know, one, um, which sort of is, is what, and people have been doing as forever I, uh, has bone cement and you know, holds the caps on and it acts as in more or less like a grout and it holds mm -hmm. those implants on. It's the, I is the, the, I am is the, 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 uh, has the shape of the cap and the grout holds the implant on. I am a cemented implant. I am, and there's some, I have some newer technology that is they have more of, I am a press fit or sort of, I am a cementless, um, I am implants are coming out now. And you don't mm -hmm. need any bone cement to hold it on. And then there's a plastic liner in between that, you know, locks into that tray. And it, it, it sort of is the cushion in between the two surfaces. Uh, and again, uh -huh. the, the sort of, it's the, the, uh, it's the art, you know, the knee replacement. I am the balancing out of those ligaments. Mm -hmm. That is, that's amazing that, that that can happen and can happen in less than an hour. That's pretty, pretty cool. Um, so that happens. The patient goes through the surgery. They're going through physical therapy. Everything's moving along like it should as, as far as the timeline goes. What can the patient expect after that time period is over? You know, the physical therapy is, is gone well. It's wrapping up. You talk with, with your patients about kind of expectations post-surgery and post-recovery about what they might be able to do, or, or there might still be some certain restrictions that as far as activity goes that they might not be able to do, you know, they might not be able to climb Mount Kilimanjaro necessarily, but um, <laughs> no. what, what sort of conversations do you have with expectations and what can they look forward to doing after the surgery and after recovery? Um, I tell patients, you know, the, the whole point of having the surgery is to get you back to your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, you, you had the surgery because you were miserable and you couldn't do all the things that you wanted to do. And so our goal is to get you back to doing all those things that you wanted to do. Now, it's my job on the front end to say, what are your goals? And if your goals, I am going to get back into the NFL, I am going to play tackle football, then I may have to reset your goals. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but you don't tell patients, you can get back to doing pretty much what you want to do. You can hike, you can bike, you can swim, you can, you, you can do pretty much what you want to do. What I caution people against, um, I am as like, uh, I am as a repetitive, high impact activity. I'll tell people, you know, now after hip or knee is not the time to go out. I am a train for a marathon. Uh, I am or to go, I am a play any tackle football or do anything crazy. Right. You can do whatever you feel comfortable doing 
um, and the, that is okay with me. Um, I will tell you, knee replacements um, do not like to kneel. They can kneel, um, but but I will say, if I, I must say probably 80% of my knee replacement patients, uh, they say it's uncomfortable to you know get down on their knees. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say that the more you do it, the better it gets. But it's just you know it's a little uncomfortable. You know, there's a scar on the front of your knee. It's just a little bit tender. Um, mm -hmm. And so they you know always like to kneel on like some knee pads or some pillows or some foam. Um, mm -hmm. Makes it you know a little more tolerable. But um, other than that, I tell my patients you know, have at it. You know, get back to to ice to doing all the things. Um, and as far as hiking mountains, you know, one of my favorite. Um, um, I got a I got a postcard from a patient. I I did both of his hips within eight weeks of each other. He had horrendous hips. Um, he went, um, and he backpacked and he climbed mountains and he, and he hiked all over Italy. Um, and he sent me, I sent me a postcard from, I am um, somewhere in Italy. And he told me about uh, how many, uh, how many mountains he had, um, he had climbed and, and I am all the miles on his Fitbit every day. Um, and so, <laughs> Yeah, it's good to wow. hear from patients, you know, what they're yeah. able to do after they have their joints replaced. That is, that's fantastic. That's, you always love to hear positive patient stories yeah. afterwards. Yes, yes. They get their life back. Yeah. Well, this has been extremely informative. We've been talking with Dr. John Shields, one of our orthopedic surgeons here at Wake Forest Baptist Health. And hopefully you all have gleaned some really good nuggets of wisdom and information. I know I have about this process and, you know, if, if you're in pain, I only encourage y'all just to take the initial step to, to come in for an initial appointment or evaluation with one of our orthopedic doctors. And you can find out more information about where our, our offices and clinics are located all throughout the, the triad region at wakehealth.edu slash ortho. Or you can call our general number at 336-716-WAKE, 336-716-WAKE. And they'll point you in the right direction to, to see one of our orthopedic providers. And they can at least have an initial discussion with you and, and talk about, you know, what the issues are and get some, some testing done or, or some other um, things done to, to help with that and see what course of treatment, you know, might be best for you. And as Dr. Shields mentioned on the top of the, the podcast, when we started, there's definitely non-surgical options as well as surgical options. They can help point you in the right direction for what's best for you. Dr. Shields, thanks so much again for talking with us and appreciate your time, sir. Sure. I thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Like I said earlier, if you all are interested in other health and wellness related topics, you can find the other Best Health Podcast episodes at wakehealth.edu slash podcast. So I encourage everyone to be safe out there take care of each other. And until we talk again, please be well. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Best Health Podcast brought to you by Wake Forest Baptist Health. For more wellness info, check out wakehealth.edu slash best health and follow us on social media. Wake Forest Baptist Health, care for life.